But we want to talk to you this morning about a theme that we've kind of we've noticed in our own lives, we've observed in our own lives, in our own journey with Jesus over the years, and kind of this theme of faithfulness. But I don't want to start there. I want to start somewhere else this morning to kind of set us up. I want to talk about expectations. I was wondering this morning whether it was too early for a Christmas story. And I feel like I'm in safe hands because you guys are like full tilt, 100 miles an hour hurtling towards Christmas. We're, we're lagging behind in Scunthorpe. We're like, like, our decks are going up in about three weeks. We're sort of, we're like late adopters as far as you guys are concerned. So I feel in, in good company this morning to kind of start with the Christmas story. You see, when I grew up, much like you guys, Christmas was a big deal for us, right? Christmas morning was like family time. It was big. Now, my family, we were a fostered family. Uh, so my, my parents were foster carers. We had other young people come and stay with us for different points during the year. And when I was maybe 15 or so, my, my sister, Laura, would have been maybe 13, 12. And, uh, and we're sat around one Christmas morning, and all of us are really excited, right? Anybody else remember those, like, Cadbury selection boxes? Yeah? I mean, if anything says Christmas, I mean, nothing says Christmas quite like a Cadbury selection box. It's the only time of year you ever see these out in the shops, right? And every Christmas morning, we would get one. And we came to expect year on year, right, that this would just be a part of, well, breakfast mostly on Christmas morning. Anybody else with me this morning? Chocolate for breakfast? Is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Right. I'm not alone. It's good. And so we came to expect every year that at some point we would unwrap a present and there, lo and behold, in front of us, as if sent from heaven, was this Cadbury selection box. And so this Christmas morning, as I say, I'm about 15, so chocolate becomes even more important the further into your teenage years you go. And, uh, and so we're there, we're unwrapping, we are full of expectancy this morning that at some point this Cadbury selection box is going to materialize. And I'm unwrapping my presents, and then the next one comes up, and it's about the right size and shape, and I start thinking to myself, I know what this is. And I unwrap it, and it's, it's amazing, and it smells brilliant, and it's a bag of peanuts, which wasn't quite what I'd been expecting. And I think, well, you know, I mean, that's all right. Peanuts are kind of fine. And and as as we're going through, my foster brother, he opens his, and he's got a bag of of peanuts as well. That's that's really weird. I mean, I start thinking to myself, you know, my sister sister really wanted a budgie for Christmas this year. Maybe, Maybe we've all got budgies. That doesn't quite, you know what I mean? Because like, this looks like budgie food to me. You know, seeds and nuts and kind of this sort of thing. And I'm going, this isn't what I was expecting. And the further around we go and the more this kind of threads out, I'm going, but hang on a minute. And we get to the bottom of our pile and there's, there's no Cadbury selection boxes to be seen. Not a single one in any pile. I'm going, but... Part of me at the deep, sort of the bottom of my heart, I want to, I want to celebrate. And my sister did get a budget, as you'll be pleased to know. Her expectations were met that Christmas. But me and my foster brother are looking at it again, but why have we got, what's the peanuts about? Like, we've not got budgies to feed. We don't particularly, where's the chocolate? My mum, trying to recover the situation, she sat around and she goes, no, no, no don't panic, don't panic. I've got Cadbury selection boxes, because what I'd not told you was that my nan always bought us Cadbury selection boxes, right? That was like our, her, one of her presents for, for us as sort of stocking fillers and this, that, and the other. And as I'm going through, I'm going, but mum, like, what's going on? She says, well, you know your cousin's not been very well. I was like, yeah. I'm thinking in the back of my head, why is that impacting my Christmas? That's not my fault, right? <laughs> We well, you know he's not been very well, and he's been in hospital a lot this year. And I go, yeah, yeah, no, I get that. He says, well, you know, he's, he's put a bit of weight on. Yeah, we don't like to talk about that at Christmas, do we? He said, well, your nan wondered whether you might, now that you're a bit older, like some healthier snacks for Christmas. And I was like, I'm not the one who's been in the hospital, right? Where's my chocolate? And she said, no, no, I have got some. So you, you will be relieved to know Christmas was salvaged, Cadbury's... Selection boxes made their way through it, and we tucked into them like, like essentially like it was breakfast. Um, but it, it highlights to me this really important lesson, right? We all have all sorts of expectations around moments like that in our life, right? Christmas is one of those things where once you've been through it a few times, you come to expect certain things, whether that be like Cadbury's selection boxes, or maybe you've got that one thing in your Christmas dinner. It's probably not sprouts, but maybe it is. 
that you go, do you know what, Christmas has to have these things in it because it's this, we come to expect it, don't we? We're creatures of habit and this makes the experience all the more valuable for us. But I wonder today whether anybody is a little bit like me in that when your expectations aren't met, how easily disappointment creeps in. And if it's true on Christmas morning with something as silly as a Cadbury's celebration box, I do wonder whether we're the same in our relationship with Jesus or in our following of God, in our worship, in our service of him, that when we have received a word from him or we've given our lives to follow him, whether we at times are prone to coming with him, to him with that same level of expectancy, that same level of, level of expectation. And my worry is, is what happens when our expectations aren't met in the way that we'd imagined? Are we still as dedicated in our service of Jesus? Are we still as close to following him in the times when we're going, God, I don't understand. I feel like you've said this. I feel like you've called us into this. I feel like you've laid this path before us. And yet what I'm looking at feels a little bit like missing your Cadbury selection box on a Christmas morning. You're going, God, where, what's going on here? Where's the chocolate? Right? I've got budgie food in my stocking. What's going on there, God? Because how we manage and how we respond to disappointment in our following of Jesus matters hugely, church. Because how we navigate these aspects of disappointment and aspects of, of feeling like we've been let down, when actually God is still going to do what he promised us. His intentions, his plans, his promises haven't changed towards us. But how we respond to our expectations not being met. Are we content this morning to go, God, I am willing, come what may, to lay down my expectations and to prefer your plans, your promises. And so that's kind of some of the stuff we want to talk through over the rest of our time together. So in a little bit, Elena's going to come and she's going to, she's going to land with us this morning. But I want to talk to us, I've knocked my water over, very sorry, from, uh, from Genesis. So one of my absolute heroes of faith, an amazing man, a man called Abraham. We first encounter him in, in Genesis chapter 12 and he's called Abram. And he has a promise from God. It's an amazing promise. And I want to read it to you this morning. Okay, so Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says this. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. There's the plans and the purposes and the promises of God being laid out before Abraham. Go to a place that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all families on earth shall be blessed. Who wants a promise like that, right? God, would you bless me that I might be a blessing? Lord God, would you lead me into a place that is of your, of your purpose, of your destiny, of your preparing? Would you lead my family forward, God? But things in Abraham's life didn't work out the way that Abraham had perhaps imagined when he receives this promise from God, going, God, would you leave me? And to his credit, Abraham does. He leaves his father's household. He goes into a completely unknown land with unknown peoples and customs to a place that he's never been to or seen before. He is faithful, you could say, as he follows God in that first stepping out moment. And yet, if you turn over your Bibles to Genesis chapter 16, things have changed. They've been at this for a while now. They've been in the land a few years. And Abraham and Sarai, they're yet to see a son. God, you've promised us that you would cause us to be a great nation. That through our family, all families would be blessed. And yet, what's going on here, God? I still don't have an heir. Genesis chapter 16 says this. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him, borne him no children, despite the fact that they'd been promised this thing by God. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Had he? So go to my servant, and may it be that I shall obtain children by her. 
What happens in life, church, when we try to bring about the purposes and the plans and the promises of God, but by our own means? It becomes real complex real quick. And I think that's what you see played out throughout Genesis chapter 16, is you see Abraham and Sarai grappling with their, their expectations, grappling with feelings of disappointment, but still holding firm to the promise that God has given them and going, well, maybe, maybe we're the problem. Maybe there's something we can do to bring about this because surely God wouldn't, would he? And they begin to work through this together and they come up with their own conclusion that Jesus, God, we're going to bring about this purpose. We believe this promise is from you. We believe you've called us into this, but we're going to work now to bring about your promises according to our time. And I wonder how often we do that in our own lives. We go, God, I believe the promises you've given me. I want to follow you faithfully as we chase after them. And yet after a few years, as promises and purposes and things that I expected to see play out, don't play out in my life in the way that I'd imagined them at the moment that God had called me. Are we still faithful to the promise after the inspiration of the moment has passed? And what I think we see in the life of Abraham and Sarai as they grapple with some of the same problems that you and I face is, is this willingness to circumvent not the promises of God because they're still holding firm to the promise. But they try to negotiate the plans and the purposes of God. And I wonder how many of you are perhaps the same as well. Elena's going to come now and she's going to bring us the second half of this message. She's going to bring us some real practical advice as we seek to navigate some of these tensions in ourselves. But perhaps where you are, if you could just close your eyes. I'd love to pray for us at this midway point just as Elena comes. For those of you that are sat going, Dan, I feel disappointed. Dan, I don't feel like the path that God has laid out for me has been the one that I expected. I'd just love to take this moment to pray for you you'll allow me. So if that's you, why don't you just put your hand somewhere near your heart if it helps you to focus this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these people this morning. I thank you for the promises that you have given to them. I thank you for the specificity of your leading of them in their life. But Lord God, we all recognize that at points and times, our expectations aren't met. And that's not because you've not promised. It's not because you don't have a plan and a purpose for our life. It's just that your plans and purposes are different from the ones that we imagined. And Lord God, as we deal with issues of disappointment and expectations not being met, would you, would you be gracious to us as we seek to follow you more closely? Amen. Amen. So Abraham is listed as someone who is faithful in the Bible. And even with moments of unfaithfulness in which he tried to fix, the, him and Sarah tried to fix the issue, they tried to fix God's promise because it wasn't happening in their time, he's still listed as someone in the Bible who is faithful. So in Hebrews, it has this list of people throughout the Bible that are considered to be people of faith. And it says this in Hebrews 11.1. 1, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. And then it goes on down to verse 8 that says this. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands in the shore. Abraham, even in his moments of unfaithfulness, came back to a place of faith. 
came back to a place of faithfulness. And I think sometimes we look at some of these stories and we go, wow, wasn't Abraham amazing? Or wasn't King David fantastic? And weren't these people in the Bible incredible? And they had these moments where they kind of like did their own thing and they made some mistakes. The Israelites, the people of God who continued to turn their back on God, yet we're still God's chosen people because thankfully our faithfulness does not determine God's faithfulness. And so when we see the story of Abraham, I'm encouraged. I look at all these people in the book of Hebrews that we're being told about, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Enoch and Noah, people who God was saying, these are faithful people, also human who made mistakes, who got stuff wrong, who tried to fulfill the promises God had for them themselves instead of waiting in God's timing. And yet God still considered them faithful people and we would consider them faithful people because they turned from their unfaithfulness back to God and they realized their mistakes and they repented of that and turned back to God. But thankfully, even in Abraham's unfaithfulness, God remains. And I find that encouraging. That for us, even when we get stuff wrong, even when we have had moments, maybe your story is filled with, oh, well, I didn't start my life as a follower of Jesus. I, or I've had moments where I've turned away. I've had moments where I've doubted or I've tried to fulfill the promises I felt God had given me. Or I felt disappointed when my expectations weren't filled. God's faithfulness still remains. That we don't have to live in doubt of whether our God is faithful. We can live in the knowledge that he remains constant, consistent. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Our God remains faithful to us. In Hebrews 13, it says to lift our weary hands in worship to God. That even as we hear of the faithfulness of others, even as we maybe are encouraged or maybe slightly disheartened that, oh, I haven't always got this stuff right. Oh, Lord, I still haven't seen your promises fulfilled. God's encouragement to us is to lift our hands in worship to him, to take our eyes off ourselves and off our own situation and to lift our eyes to him in worship. Because he is forever faithful. His faithfulness remains. In our weakness, sin and suffering, God is faithful so we can be too. And I am encouraged and I am glad that we have a God who is consistent, who is faithful. God could have turned to Abraham and said, you made this decision. You chose You might say your wife led you down that way, but you chose to have a child that wasn't the one I had given to you. You chose to go and have a child with your your wife's servant. God could have turned around and gone, well, that's it. The promise is over, it's done, it's ruined, but thankfully, our God is a God of his word. And he doesn't, he isn't swayed by us in, in our mistakes. He isn't swayed by the fact that we're human. He's totally aware of all of the things that we have going on. He's totally aware of the fact that we will t- at times sin and make mistakes and yet he chooses to remain faithful to us. And it's not that he, it's an option to him. This is who God is. God is faithful. God is constant. We have times when we go, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to be faithful. I'm, I'm going to do the right thing. And then our feelings sort of get in the way. And we sort of go, oh, but today I'm tired. So I might not, I might, you know, you start your new exercise regime on a Monday, of course. And you get up on Monday morning, and you're like, yes, I'm here. And this is going to be for the long haul and I'm going to do this and I'm going to be consistent. And then it gets to Wednesday morning and you're starting to feel a bit tired. And then Thursday morning you go, it'll be all right. I'm just going to sleep for a little bit longer. And our feelings, our humanness gets in the way. But thankfully our God doesn't have that issue. He doesn't have humanness getting in the way because it's not just what It's not just something he encompasses. It's who he is. He is faithful. And our challenge is to live a life of faithfulness, even when it doesn't make sense, 
even when it isn't meeting our expectations, even when we're going, Lord, I thought my life would take this turn. I didn't expect that this would happen to me. I didn't realize that when we started our journey, this is where we would end up. When me and Dan first got married, um, I was working for a different church as a, a children's pastor. And Dan struggled to get a job anywhere. Like even as a pizza delivery driver, they just wouldn't have him. He applied to everywhere. And and we first got married. I was on a very slim sort of wage. So I was working three different jobs to try and keep the lights on in the house. And um, when we got married, we were just like, we we don't know how we're going to do this. And, And most months, we had to choose between fuel for our car or food for our kitchen. And um, I I still remember to this day, my dad sitting with me and going, right, Elaine, we're going to have to go through your budget because this isn't normal. Like, you you know, you need to be able to budget better. And he looks through it and he goes, oh, um, it's not that you're not budgeting. It's that this isn't working. Like, you, you aren't getting enough in. And I really felt that God had asked me to be the kids pastor at the church and to stay there even though it wasn't affording us a basic sort of life and Dan was struggling to get a job and he was taking on bits and pieces here and he tried some self-employed stuff for a while and some of that was really difficult to manage and at one point I was sort of like well I could sort of go and get a job in a school I could sort of like finish what I'm doing and and go and get a job in a school because I know that it would be a more consistent wage. I could get a full-time job that way because they could afford that. And and we felt just this real nudge of God, stay faithful. Don't, I know it doesn't look the way you thought it would, but stay faithful. And it, there were moments when it was really painful because you would just be like, Lord, we don't even know if we've got enough money to cover our rent this month, never mind anything else. And the moments that we saw God break through in miraculous ways and declare his faithfulness were moments that will forever mark our lives, of having food parcels suddenly dropped on our doorstep and we have no idea who dropped it, having a Tesco gift card through the door, having A small group, I I don't know what you call them, small group or connect group, round to the house and we committed to feeding them. And Dan's going, we don't have enough food. We've literally got a chicken breast, some lasagna sheets and some cheese. And we had chopped tomatoes, right? And, um, And we make this random chicken lasagna thing that was enough to serve three people at a push. And there was maybe eight or nine people coming for small group. And yet it kept going and it kept going. And, and we saw moments of Jesus' faithfulness to us. Not, because of, not just because of our faithfulness to him, but in no small part because of that. And, and Jesus isn't saying, you be faithful to me and I will be faithful to you. He's saying, I am faithful to you, therefore be faithful to me. He's not saying, this is going to be easy. I think sometimes people go, well... If I become a follower of Jesus, it all gets easy, right? No. Life happens. The the world is the way it is. And yet, God calls us out into faithfulness because of his faithfulness. He didn't die on the cross because we were faithful. He died on the cross because he is faithful. But as we were preparing this message, the one thing that continued to come back to me time and time again, and I really felt strongly, was for those that have been faithful. There are people here that have continuously been faithful, quiet faithfulness, and they haven't made a big deal about it, and they haven't shouted about it from the rooftops. They've just continued to be faithful to their Lord and haven't always seen the promises of God fulfilled yet haven't seen the things that they hoped for and desired come to fruition yet, but yet have continued to be faithful. And those, the people that do this are the people that change the world, are the people that make a huge difference in the world around them. And God will always fulfill his promises, always. 
It might not happen in the way that we hoped. It might not happen in the way we expected. But God is faithful and he's yearning for our faithfulness to him. My um, granddad on my dad's side was the first person to become a Christian in his in, in his family and eventually his dad did become a Christian because of my granddad's faith and at 10 years old he became a Christian and his quiet my, you, you've, you'll never get to meet him because he's with Jesus now but his quiet faithfulness he was a man of of just he was such a beautiful man such a generous kind loyal faithful man who quietly just got on he just gently slip a pocket full of cash to someone. he just, every morning he'd get down on his hands and knees and he'd pray to Jesus. When we were on holiday together as a family, he's still praying in his bedroom. He, this quiet faithfulness of, my God deserves my faithfulness because of his faithfulness to me. And his decision at the age of 10 to follow Jesus and to live a life of faithfulness meant that his three children were exposed to Jesus and and they all then went on their journey to follow Jesus. My dad became a Christian at eight years old, which meant that his then faithfulness impacted on his children. And I became a Christian at four years old. And my faithfulness means my daughter is being brought up in a church community where she can have the chance to find and follow Jesus. A generational faithfulness. And this isn't just if you have biological children. Your faithfulness impacts the world around you. You are creating a change in your world because of your faithfulness. And that quiet, consistent, gentle faithfulness of so many people. And we sometimes sit and we go, but nobody sees it. Lord, I've been faithful to you. I'm being faithful to you. I haven't had the acknowledgement I thought I would. or I haven't had the, the, the promises fulfilled. Or my life hasn't gone the way I expected it to. And God is just yearning for your faithfulness. Keep being faithful, my child. Keep yourself close to me. Don't be disheartened because the world isn't celebrating faithfulness. Jesus celebrates faithfulness. The world celebrates, you do you, you look after you, you is king, me is king, I am the one that needs to be looked after and God celebrates faithfulness and he celebrates a life of of service and goodness. And even in our mistakes and our sin, he still brings about his goodness through our faithfulness. We are not just people wandering the earth. We are children of the Most High King. A King who has been faithful from the beginning and will be to the end. Who celebrates the lives of people who have continued to be faithful. I heard yesterday that Kath and John have been here for 25 years. 25 years of faithfulness in one place. That's unheard of. And yet their faithfulness 25 years ago impacts the room today and generations to come. And we get, to, we get to be recipients of other people's faithfulness and goodness. And so where is ours? When you are stood going, but Lord, this is hard. I didn't expect to have a child that was ill. I didn't expect to be left without children. I didn't expect to lose my job. I didn't expect that I would be hit with illness. And our God is saying, continue to be faithful. I promise to be faithful to you. You continue to be faithful to me. And we may not see our promise or our reward filled on this earth. But our Jesus never breaks a promise. And we will see him fulfill that in one way or another. And that may be when we are greeted in the arms of Jesus. When our earthly lives end and our spirit and our heavenly life starts, or it might happen on this earth. But for the parent in here that's on their hands and knees praying for their child to come to know Jesus, keep being faithful. 
Don't stop. Your faithfulness is making a difference. For the child that is praying for their parent to come to know Jesus, keep being faithful. Your faithfulness speaks louder to them than any word that you could utter. For the person in the room that is struggling because, Lord, I didn't expect to be sick. I didn't expect my body to become ill or my mind to struggle. Keep being faithful. His faithfulness and his love endure forever. And as we were praying this morning, God dropped in my heart Psalm 100. And I had no idea faith would start the service with it. And it says this. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gate with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise him. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. When you are feeling like, I can't do this anymore, lift your voice in worship. When you feel like it's too hard and it's too much, lift your hands in praise to him because our faithfulness to him is so important and he will continue to be faithful to you. He is a God of faithfulness and promises. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He will not abandon you. He is with you. And when you are walking through the darkest valley, he's right next to you. He has not walked away from you. And our God yearns and hopes for our faithfulness but even in the moments where we lack he is still faithful even in the moments where we feel like we are not enough he is still faithful in the moments as you raise children feeling like lord I don't know if I can do this I hope I'm giving them enough he is faithful give them to him In the moments where, Lord, my job is not what I expected. I'm not doing what I thought I'd be doing or I've lost my job. Give it to him. Only him. Our Jesus and our saviour. The one who remains faithful through all things. He will not abandon you or forsake you. He has never left you. And in the dark moments, he is with you. A couple of years ago, I shared briefly yesterday that I struggled massively with a level of anxiety and it came back after having Abigail and I felt so alone. And I said, Lord, am I doing the right thing? And in a dark, dark moment, I felt the Lord wrap his arms around me and remind me I'm his that he will never leave me, that he will continue to be faithful to me. And all he asks is I do my best to be faithful to him. That in one of the darkest moments of my life, my God reached out to me and reminded me I'm his. And as we prepared this message, I felt there were people in this room that felt that deeply. There are people here going, Lord, I look like I've got it together on the outside. I turn up to church and I smile and I tell people I'm good. I keep doing the right things, Lord. I keep trying to be faithful. Let him carry you. His faithfulness endures forever through the generations. We have never been left. We will not be left. And so I want to pray this morning, especially for those that have just continued to be faithful. For those that feel like, Lord, this is a hard journey. I've lost much. It's not met my expectations. That's okay. It's okay to say that. God is big enough and strong enough to take it. But just, I want to pray for those that feel like, Lord, this is hard. I sit with my grandparents that are still alive, my nan and granddad that live just down the road. And I listen to their stories of faithfulness. 
I listen to their stories of God's faithfulness and I'm encouraged and reminded of God's faithfulness to me. So if you are feeling that way in that dark place of God, I've been faithful and yet surround yourself with people who will build your faith. That's what a church community is for. Kath was telling me that there's a couple in the church that have been married for over 50 years and they were there yesterday and they've just been continuously faithful continuously faithful they're the sort of people we need to be round they're the sort of people that we need to be sitting at the feet of and saying tell me how did you do this teach me about the faithfulness of God in your life so that I can be encouraged I know God is faithful but the stories of others spur us on and so let's sit at the feet of those that we know have been through the mill and continue to be faithful to God. So I'm going to pray. I'd love it if you'd stand with me, actually, as we pray, if you can. And if this is a message that is speaking into your heart, and this is for you, I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand, but I'm just going to ask you just to have your heart and your ears open to God. Because I just feel like God is trying to say something to some people. Lord Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that in all things, through all time, you have been faithful at the very beginning of the earth right to the end. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've chosen us to be your people, that you love us. Lord Jesus, that you died and rose again for us. Lord, would you help us in our journey to be people that would have the courage to continue to be faithful. That we would be people that would stretch out our arms in worship to you and take our eyes off ourselves and lift them to you. Lord, that we would be people known for our faith. And Lord, for those this morning that feel like they have been faithful for such a long time and yet I've struggled to see the fulfillment of your promises I've struggled to feel that they're doing the right thing Lord God would you just fill them with your peace and your presence right now would they feel the enveloping the gentle warm and loving arms of you around them knowing they are your children and you are pleased with them that their faithfulness to you has brought you joy and that they would know you will always continue to be faithful to them Lord I thank you for who you are I thank you for all that you do and I thank you Lord God that we get to be part of this journey in your name we pray Amen Oh, 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 oh,